Hello and welcome to our daily COVID-19 update where we'll be speaking to the Minister of Health, the Honourable Dr. Frank Anthony. Hello Minister, thank you for having us again today. Um, now let's just jump right into it uh, with the COVID-19 immunization campaign. We would have seen an, a very positive response from persons 60 years and above. Um, are we seeing similar trends with those 40 years and older? Yeah, we actually have a lot of people coming out to get their vaccines and um, we are working to immunize as many people as possible. I think the response has been tremendous. Um, in all the regions, people are coming forward to get their vaccines, which is a positive thing. There are a few that kind of lagging behind and um, perhaps uh, there are some myths that they have, but as fast as we learn a little bit m more about what is preventing them, we are working to try to dispel those myths. So, but I think overall, um, the response has been good. Okay, um, and what, what's the number looking like to date? As of yesterday, we have completed 67,524 uh, immunization, uh, which is which is really good. So we are, we are increasing every day. Okay. Um, Minister, I know you would have mentioned there are some areas that have been lagging and recently we would have spoken about the resistance in Region 10. Um, is there still a resistance by persons um, in taking the vaccine? It has improved since we last spoke, um, but I think we can get better. And what we are trying to do is to work with different community groups in dispelling whatever myths they have and to try to get people to come out to the immunization centers. Uh, we have moved away from some of the fixed sites that we have. We have gone closer into the community, and I think that is working. So we will see improvement in those areas. Okay. Minister, I know um, some of the communities are along the, the rivers. Are we also going into those communities as well? Yes, we are planning to, to do some vaccination in those areas. and. Um, we have already commenced an assessment, say in the Baris River area, to look at um, what we need, how much population we have there and so forth. And then by next week, uh, they're planning to go back and do the immunization. Okay, um, would you say there would, have, there would need to be a sensitization campaign, an education campaign on the vaccines to encourage more persons in these particular communities? Because I know some of them would not have the basic amenities such as access to the internet to get information on the vaccine um, for them to take it. Well, we are doing a number of things. One, we have been talking about the various vaccines that we have currently in Guyana and its use and side effects and those types of things. So we have programs where we are discussing those. And we also would encourage uh, community leaders, healthcare workers and so forth, uh, train them in order to um, understand better how the vaccine works and to pass that on to the different people in the community. So that's an ongoing exercise. And we have also been working with a number of the community leaders uh, to get them to understand a little bit more about vaccine. And hopefully they can then work with their peers, with their, uh, their, the persons within their community uh, to help them to understand how these things work. Sometimes when Healthcare people talk about vaccines. Uh, people might have, some people would have confidence and listen. Others prefer to get their information, maybe from a friend, somebody they know. And therefore, that's why we are trying to educate people uh, about these vaccines. So there are different strategies that we're using. Um, hopefully, by using these different methods that we'll get more information across to people because this is very important. One of the challenges that globally we have seen is a lot of misinformation pertaining to vaccine. And as you know, a lot of people have access to internet. So if they're not using the right websites, for example, if they're not looking at the academic journals and what the scientists are saying, uh, they can easily be misled by persons who they're very persuasive in their argument but not necessarily uh, bringing out uh, what is factual about these vaccines. 
So we have to be careful and we have to um, analyze for ourselves uh, what is the best information, where the source of that information, and to make sure that we then use the right uh, set of uh, guidance to inform ourselves and to inform our decision. So it's, it's an ongoing job and, uh, you know, our PR department is constantly working at this. Okay, thank you for that, Minister. Now I would like to turn your attention to the ICU. At this time, can you see how many patients have been admitted to the COVID-19 ICU at the Infectious Disease Hospital? Currently, we have 74 persons who have been hospitalized across Guyana. We have uh, nine persons who are at the West Demerara Hospital. We have three persons who are at New Amsterdam Hospital and three persons who are in the Linden Hospital. Uh, the rest of persons are in uh, the Ocean View facility. Uh, of those who are at Ocean View, we have 15 patients that are in the ICU and uh, they're receiving treatment. Uh, those patients, we have to assist them uh, with breathing. So um, that's what, what we have right now and the doctors and the staff, they are working with them. Okay, Minister. Now, I know Region 4 continues to be the region that would, rec re would record the highest number of COVID-19 cases. Um, have you identified a particular hot spot within the region? In Region 4, there are uh, some areas that we have seen cases, persistent cases. So on the East Bank, um, we have had for a number of weeks now uh, cases in Diamond, Herstelling, Eccles. Uh, in Georgetown, we have seen cases in Kitty, Camberville, um, parts of uh, South Ramvelt. So these are the areas in Georgetown that we are seeing cases. And on the East Coast, uh, we have seen in Luziknan, uh, Good Hope area, that uh, we are getting a number of cases. So, but across the, the East Coast, across Georgetown, across the East Bank, there are cases. So we might have one or two cases in, in every community, but those areas that I mentioned, we have in excess of uh, 10 to 15 cases in those areas. Okay, and I know some of the areas you, that you would have called there are fixed COVID-19 testing spots, but um, is there any possibility of setting up mobile testing um, facilities um, in some of those areas as well? Well, testing, testing would assist us in knowing, uh, but what is more important is that people take precautions to, get, to prevent them from getting sick. And those precautions would include that they have to keep wearing their mask and, and making sure that they keep their distance and so forth. We have, we have been talking about this. I think uh, a lot of people are fatigued and uh, they believe that, you know, somehow because uh, over the, the last year or so they haven't got infected, that whatever behavior they're practicing, that they're, they're somehow invincible to the disease. This is not, you know, this is not so if you are taking risk by not wearing masks and keeping your distance and doing all the wrong things, at some point you are going to get infected. And we want people to understand that this is a very serious disease because we have seen a rise in cases, especially in Region 4, and we have also seen an increase in hospitalization. And I'm sure everybody has seen that we are also getting uh, more deaths because the people who are coming into hospital, they're much sicker and therefore um, we have more difficulties in managing these complicated patients when they come at this late stage to the ICU. Okay. I know the ministry would have been engaging persons across the country in terms of educating, but are we, in these particular areas that you have named, are we um, doing any sort of assessment or speaking to anybody within the community to help get that message across better? We have been doing that, um, but again, it's a constant, it's a constant engagement and um, we, we have to keep doing it. And even those persons who 
we identify as being infected, we have been talking to them, they have been counseled, we have been um, getting them to stay home and to do all the right things and of course their loved ones because if they're living at home with other people in the home then the proper procedures of how to isolate and so forth. So it's an ongoing exercise and um, we have to keep keep working at it and making sure that people understand how serious this disease is. Okay, Minister, thank you for that. Now, I want to come off of COVID-19 for a little bit. Now, on April 14, the world community celebrates World Chagas Disease Day. This year is only the second year to observe this day, and the main aim is to make, the main aim of the day is to increase awareness of um, the Chagas disease. The name is new to many persons in Guyana. Um, how prevalent is this vector-borne disease? Uh, Chagas is one of the, what might be termed as a neglected uh, disease. Uh, it has been identified by the WHO as one of the neglected diseases that we should work to eliminate by 2030. Uh, the WHO has, uh, earlier this year, put up a plan for how countries who are affected by Chagas can help to eliminate this disease. We have had Chagas in Guyana for a while, but we don't have a lot of cases. I think on average we probably would get maybe 150 to 200 cases. But Chagas is a disease where you would get bitten by what is called a kissing bug and the parasite uh, Trypanosomosa cruci, which is the parasite that you get infected with, would get into the body. It can, um, when, when you first get bitten, you would have what is called an acute phase, which probably lasts for maybe about six weeks or so. And then after that, people become asymptomatic meaning that the parasite lives in their body for a long period of time. And in some cases, if they are not treated, that parasite continues to live with them for maybe uh, 15 to 20 years, but it would do underlying damage. And so after this prolonged period in the chronic phase, uh, you would see patients who would have maybe heart problems, and in some cases, they would have uh, problems of their digestive tract. So it is important that we identify the areas where we have the prevalence of this disease and we work to eliminate it. Uh, we have a unit within the Ministry of Health uh, that is called the Vector Control Unit and they have been working on Chagas as well as other vector-borne diseases and we have a plan of how we are going to reduce the prevalence of this disease and ultimately work for its elimination. One of the strategies that can help and probably because we have been using this uh, it has caused a drop in the cases that we are seeing is to use bed nets that are impregnated with um, insecticide. Because if you use that to protect yourself from malaria, it also protects from other insects. And we have been over the years distributing insecticide impregnated bed nets to communities, especially in the interior where uh, people might be affected with malaria. We have a program that we would be um, rolling out shortly uh, for malaria, but it would also help in this case with Chagas because we are going to be distributing approximately 150,000 bed nets to these interior communities. The ministry has already sourced the bed nets and very shortly we'll be rolling out that program. So it works for malaria, it would work for other vector-borne disease in uh, preventing people from getting bitten and once we prevent that we are going to reduce the prevalence of this disease. Uh, our clinicians in those areas too I'm sure are aware of the signs and symptoms of the disease so when we see those patients 
uh, they report them to the vector control unit so that we can uh, keep track of the cases and treat appropriately. Okay, what are some of the signs and symptoms of this disease, Minister? Uh, some of it would include at the site where you're bitten, um, you can have some swelling, and then ultimately you'll have things like fever and, and so forth, fatigue, um, enlargement of the spleen, enlargement of the liver. So these are in the acute phases. Uh, enlargement of lymph nodes and um, in the chronic phases people remain pretty much asymptomatic until you start having problems with uh, your heart and so forth so uh, it is something that if you're living in a area that is known to have chagas that you have to be careful and be properly screened and evaluated. Okay, Minister, thank you so much for that. Thank you for your time today. This has been DPI's COVID-19 update. For more information, visit our website, dpi.gov.gy or our social media platforms.